You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Join us now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. Welcome back to Options Insider Radio, the interview program here on the old network where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of options and derivatives and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listener. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. If I sound a little bit different, if you hear a little bit of background noise and people talking, it's because we're not at our studio in Chicago. No, we're down the street at the Trading Show Chicago here where we're getting the lay of the land and all sorts of interesting new ventures and asset classes and all sorts of fun stuff and having a great slate of new guests lined up, including our next two guests. They're newcomers to the network. We have Joshua Ho and Darius Sitt, the partner and managing partner at uh, QCP Capital. Gentlemen, welcome to the network. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, let's start. Let's go in order. Maybe Joshua will start with you and then Darius the same question. Give us a little bit of an overview of your background in the financial space and then one or maybe both of you can tell us what the heck it is you guys do over there at QCP Capital. Sure thing. I'll, uh, I'll start. This is Josh here. Um, so I come from a legal background originally. I will let's end this show right now. I'm sorry. No, no lawyers on, on my So I, I, I just make sure that whatever Darius does is kosher. Um, that being said, I, I come from a... Do they uh, allow lawyers in the crypto space? I didn't know they were allowed. I, they keep us in the dark and mm. you know they feed it like mushrooms. Um, essentially, I take care of the ops and uh, growth at QCP. We're a prop trading firm based out of Singapore, focused entirely on digital assets. Um, I've taken a longer view on the space, having started around 2014. Uh, over, overheard someone talking about Bitcoin and started taking a closer look at the space. Um, and Hopefully since you then, bought and held all the way through the end of 2017. That's what it, everyone did, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think for us, we're a little more actively managed. Uh, I'll let Darius tell you a little bit more himself and, and, and the firm. Well, Darius, same question for you. Give us a little bit of an overview of your background and what it is you do at QCP. So uh, I come from a macro trading background. Uh, I started my career at a fund, macro fund in Singapore called Diamond Asia. And after that was trading Asia FX and bonds at BNP Paribas. Um, started the crypto space uh, from a pure capital markets perspective. Uh, we started doing the arbitrage uh, in early 2017. And uh, right now, you know, we are a 30-man team uh, out of Singapore focused on uh, proprietary trading as well as uh, running an OTC desk. Um, the proprietary desk is uh, focused a lot on uh, local markets and uh, local currency markets in Asia, as well as uh, derivatives. So you know, we run a fairly large uh, Bitcoin and Ether options and swaps book. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, give us, we've had a lot of guests on that, you know, come from all different aspects of the crypto space. I'm, I'm trying to think, I think you're the first we've had on from Singapore. Uh, so I'm kind of curious, give our audience a little bit of an overview, a little bit of the lay of the land. What is, what is the burgeoning crypto scene in Singapore? What, what is it like? Are they a lot of funds? Are they trading a lot of different things? What's it like over there? So uh, Singapore is a, is, is, has become a bit of an epicenter for crypto projects because the regulations are friendly for ICO projects uh, and other types of crypto projects. Uh, the banking is a bit easier than Hong Kong as well. So uh, Hong Kong tends to be a bit more trading focused crypto wise, where Singapore tends to house a lot of these projects. Um, and uh, Singapore also has planned regulations uh, to some, somewhat legalize crypto. Um, and that makes it easier for us as well. So, you know, uh, it's a good place to be. Um, it's like, uh, you know, it's traditionally the FX center of Asia. And uh, I think it's uh, very fast becoming the crypto center of Asia as well. That do, you mentioned kind of the regulation, obviously China kind of cracking down a lot these days. Has that driven a lot of the, a lot of the business, a lot of the impetus your way? Uh, yes and no. Um, you know, I, 
you know, it, the crackdown in China is 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 uh, I would say that there is a crackdown, but at the same time, you know, there's a lot of activity in crypto in China. Uh, a, a lot of it is done through personal accounts, um, and the network is really wide. So you know, I I would say even though uh, there's a crackdown, the activity is really really still um, at, at a high. And obviously, we're here in Chicago at the trading show. A lot of crypto talk going on here. What is it? Obviously, talking to me is a big deal. But aside from that, what is it that brings you all the way to Chicago here to the uh, to the crypto or to the trading show? I should say. Actually, the one of the main reasons why we're here is uh, we help to organize a uh, sort of mini conference called uh, Crypto OTC Roundtable Asia. Um, even though it's Asia, we we sort of what we did is we brought a lot of the big dealers in the space together to discuss how to further the derivative space in crypto. So, you know, something like uh, coming up with, uh, discussing and coming up with a crypto is the CSA uh, in order for, in order to have standardization and, and, and scale in the derivative space in crypto. And how is that project progressing? Obviously, that's near and dear to our hearts. We, we come to the, the crypto space from the derivative side. Uh, we had a lot of co good conversations with firms like Acuna and others to kind of give us a good glimpse into the OTC option side of the Bitcoin and crypto space. How are those talks? How is that conference? How is that progressing? Is there some movement on that front? Oh, very good progress, right? Um, the first conference was held in Singapore, a uh, core group of uh, OTC dealers. This, this is the second meeting that we've had. Uh, it was sponsored by Silvergate uh, and a much wider and broader audience. The discussion was a lot deeper as well. You know, uh, moving on from discussing like settlements to talking about defaults, talking about KYC standards. Um, I think it's very, 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 very uh, 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 useful for us in terms of expanding the market. And I think, um, you know, the one important thing here is that, uh, um, you know, what, the current space is a lot of bilateral dealing. You know, we do Lacuna a lot as well. Um, but, you know, if, if the space is to scale and grow, we need to have to be able to innovate between parties, to be able to, uh, to, to deal beyond just bilateral, uh, 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 just bilateral contracts, right? So, um, you know, we're trying to create a whole market here for, for both swaps and options. And, you know, it has been fascinating. Uh, we like to see the growth in that. Uh, are you as, as surprised as I am, you know, in the, in the hot and heavy days of late 2017, early 2018, when, when you know, Bitcoin was racing to 20,000, CME and SIBO were racing each other to list the, the futures? It seemed like a no-brainer that listed options were coming next, right? That was just a, it was going to happen. We were polling our audience. Most of them were going to happen in Q1. That's how fast they thought it was going to happen. Here we are a year and change later. It still hasn't happened. Uh, in fact, we've, we've seen SIBO getting out of that business uh, now. And then we're hearing rumors of maybe some, some opening of the, of, the, of the kimono at the CFTC here in terms of, uh, you know, maybe ETH futures and things like that. But still no options. Are, are you as surprised as I am, at least for here in the domestic U.S., that we haven't been quicker to maybe on the uptake with some of these derivatives products? So I, I come from an FX trading background, and I've always felt that crypto was more like FX than equity derivatives, for example, than, more like FX than equities or commodities, in that uh, to this day, FX is still largely traded OTC, and FX options are like 99% OTC. You don't have listed FX options, right? Uh, I, I tend to think that, that crypto will take the same path. Um, and to answer your question, no, I'm not surprised. Uh, even in the spot markets, uh, the OTC markets still tend to dominate. And I think it would be the same for, for, for derivatives in crypto. And in terms of like the size players out there, institutions that are using a lot of your, your OTC desk, uh, what's it been like dealing with them over the last, let's say, year and change? Obviously, coming into last year, we saw their pronounced sell-off in most of the crypto assets. It was, uh, I think, disheartening, I think, to say the least, to a lot of, a lot of the players out there. Uh, did you see that anecdotally as well from a lot of the funds and other players? Did your volume maybe on the OTC desk, on the options side, maybe did that start to dry up as a result? And, and, and maybe conversely, in the last month, month and a half that we've seen, you know, the, the worm turn a little bit and start to shift to the upside, has it picked up again? Well, maybe let me answer this from an Asian perspective, because uh, while the crypto markets were experiencing a winter, so to speak, uh, our volumes on the desk actually went up, but not, not, not particularly in Bitcoin or Ether or other tokens, but stablecoin. So a Asia is stablecoin land. You know, it's a, it's a region where the countries have capital controls and monetary mobility is a problem. So the fundamental utility of uh, crypto actually comes up very strongly in Asia uh, and true stablecoin. So, you know, as, um, as, you know, if you compare an Asian OTC desk to an European OTC desk or an American OTC desk, uh, you'd see that 
while the American or European desks uh, tend to have uh, probably 70-80% of the volume in, in, in tokens or coins, uh, in Asia it tends to be dominated by stablecoin. Uh, and it's become a means, a conventional means of, of moving money between cross-border. Um, and so, you know, that, that I think that as the crypto winter took a turn, what we saw was a, a fundamental drawback to a core, the core utility of monetary mobility. And that actually saw, we saw an expansion of that rather than a shrinkage. And that was very encouraging for us. So the market was actually growing. I mean, adoption was growing as well. You know, if you go to Hong Kong, uh, you go to the money changes, you can actually trade Tether on the spot physically. That kind of adoption, I don't think, uh, you know, I think it's very deep adoption and, and, and it's very encouraging for us crypto players. What, was Tether the biggest one you got outside of Bitcoin? You mentioned which, which of these stable coins was the one that um, was really the, the say, lion's yeah. share of your activity there. Yeah, I think Tether, Tether definitely dominates. I mean, even with negative headlines. I was going to say, with all the, all the negative blowback yeah. it got over the last year, that didn't impact it at all? So, you know, just an interest, interesting point here is that, you know, while, while Tether has had neg negative headlines in the last week or so, uh, in, in China is still trading a premium. Uh, so, you know, the adoption is very, very strong in, in Asia um, and speaking up and growing as well. So, um, yeah, you know, so Tether and, you know, other coins like USDC, PAX, uh, uh, TUSD are coming up as well. So we've been seeing incre increasing amounts of trading in these in like c countries like Korea, Indonesia. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we'll continue to see that grow as well. Speaking of, of controversies, obviously there was, there was a controversy over a year ago now, wasn't it, with that, uh, that Tether was being used to manipulate uh, Bitcoin in the run up to 20,000. Now the, the latest controversial data in the last month, month and a half, seems to be uh, this, this report out of Bitwise, you're probably familiar with it, that says well, effectively, what, 95% of the marketplace, the volume as we know it, it is fraudulent, is, is duplicitous. Uh, I'm curious, you, you transact in this marketplace every day. What are your thoughts on those numbers they're throwing around? You think there, there, there is some truth to those? I'm not sure about 95%, uh, but the market, I mean, it's, it's nothing to do with, with fraud per se, but it's just the fact that the market is small. I mean, even with this run up, they said the entire crypto spot market is below $200 billion. I mean, compared to traditional assets, that's tiny. So it's not about, I don't think it's about fraudulent, but it's just that the, uh, the size of the market allows it, allows, uh, you know, it gets, gets it easily manipulated and cornered. So, you know, uh, I, I don't think, um, it's something that we just have to deal with, right? Uh, you know, especially on the option side, where, you know, you, if you look at the, at, 2019, the first three months, you might assume that Bitcoin vol has, has uh, you know, has, has come down and, and the market has matured. But in April, you suddenly see a spike up, you know, just just from a, just from a maybe a hundred, a couple hundred bucks movement, right? Uh, you know, the market is just too small. So I think it's a matter of size and that's why we're actually, actually focusing a lot more on derivatives because we think that, that options, swaps, you know, yield products, uh, leverage products are a means for the market to scale up from its tiny size at the moment. I know, I know obviously this is a, a crypto-oriented show. You guys do a lot with crypto, but obviously you're, you're a prop shop there. You trade a lot of things over there in Singapore. I, I'm curious to, uh, you know, give us a little bit of an overview of, uh, of the, the Singaporean uh, options scene, if you will. Are there a lot of, are a lot of firms, are a lot of market, how's the market making scene there? A lot of funds trading it. What, what's it like uh, on the options side there in Singapore? Well, I mean, we, we trade only crypto, uh, but I guess, uh, Singapore has a decent number of funds that, that do trade derivatives and, and FX and other commodities and whatnot. Um, I think pretty similar to Hong Kong, you know, uh, the regulatory environment is, is, is pretty friendly. The, the tax environment is pretty friendly as well. Um, I wouldn't say nothing, nothing too special, but uh, I, I started my career at, at a fund in Singapore. So, you know, I think it's a pretty decent place to, to, to trade. And, you know, obviously you're involved in some of these organizations that are out there, you know, fostering and, and supporting the, the crypto derivative space. We like to leave our audience on, on a happy note, wanting more, something fun, a tease. So maybe looking down the road a little bit, maybe some of these organizations you're involved with, what are you looking forward to? What can you expect uh, in the next coming, you know, three to six months uh, on the crypto derivatives front? That, that is maybe exciting to you, maybe regulatory, maybe a contract, something else coming online. What is it that gets you, gets you excited these days? So, I mean, one of the things that we are very excited about is what we're seeing as something like bridging between the crypto world and the real world. The real uh, world. <laughs> you know, traditional assets, you know, yes. I think there's been a big move globally and in Singapore as well of uh, mature companies that are looking for, you know, non-bank financing. At the same time, you have crypto balance sheet guys who are looking for yield and it's a great match, right? You know, uh, it's a great match for, for guys looking for yield and, you know, to invest in good projects, uh, in credit products that are, 
that are that have proper due diligence done and you know and uh, with the credit risk properly priced I think that's something that we've been focusing on trying to bridge those two worlds uh, and that's where you know, the, uh, swaps come come into play very very importantly uh, to be able to have a, a proper system margining system collateral system to execute this sw these swaps and you have uh, it's a win-win situation right you're going to bring uh, traditional market scale into the crypto space at the same time you're going to bring a uh, proper yield into for the crypto guys as well these right swaps seem like a good starting point they're uh, very prevalent overseas the, the regulation they're a little bit easier from a regulatory perspective than an actual option uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of nice fewer moving parts uh, on the swap that uh, could get hung up on well gentlemen this is great to kind of catch up with you have you guys give us a little bit of an overview of the lay of the land of the burgeoning crypto scene there uh, in Singapore and it maybe for some of our audience wants to reach out with you maybe they have some questions maybe they're they're trading in the space they want to engage with you guys maybe they just want to learn more about what you guys do uh, where should they go what should they do um, you can reach us uh, on our website, qcb.capital, or you know, hit us up on Twitter uh, at QCB Capital as well. Dot capital, the dot capital domain. I like that. Not, not, a, not a frequently seen one, but I like it. Well, Joshua and Darius, I appreciate you guys joining us. I look forward to seeing how some of this bridging unfolds in the marketplace here in the coming months. Thank you so much. Thank you. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.